For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, this is very, very strong language. I want you to pay real close attention to what John says here. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into, into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Father, we pray that you bless the reading of your word, that we'd have open hearts and receptive ears. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So let's set a little historical basis. This is around A.D. 90. And to set into uh, the chronological order, Revelation was written somewhere around 95 to 96 A.D. And this is around 90. So about six years prior uh, to, we find that John writes this shortest epistle. And it's very peculiar wording in that he says the elder. He is referring to himself as an elder in the church, a pastor. He is uh, referring to himself as that elder. And he is referencing his position more than likely. Uh, this is not a, a hundred percent uh, with surety, but 99.9 .9 will say that he was talking about being an elder in the church at Ephesus. Okay, to set a little background for you. And we find that he is speaking to a peculiar person or a place. Now, y'all going to have to stay real close with me right here. If you have a certain study reference Bible, and then we're live streaming, and I don't want to copyright infringe your heading about this particular or this commentary in particular, may say that it was a church that John was writing this letter to. And that is perfectly okay. Your Bible commentary is not wrong. But on the other hand, if you have a Bible in your lap that is a reference or a study Bible, it is a good possibility that John is literally talking to one lady, a real woman. So we either have the church or a literal woman. We can agree on that. Scholars are split right down the middle. Um, there are certain scholars that believe he is talking to the church. Others say he is talking to a lady, an elect lady, a Christian lady, probably one of prominence in the church. And he says something else. To, unto the elect lady and her children. So visualize this. If you want to run down the aisle that he's speaking to the church, perfectly fine. Is possibly talking about other churches within the church of Ephesus. So what that would be would be church planting out of the church at Ephesus. If he's speaking to the woman here, a literal, physical, adult female, some people can't define that today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's a good possibility that if that is who he's writing to, that this lady literally has children within her home that have not, let, uh, not yet left, but is having what we would know as church within the home. Right? So if you want to run your mind and heart down the church idea or down the elect lady being a physical, literal female, there's nothing wrong with either one of those two. Because 
Guess what? It's not with 100% surety that we know which one John is referencing to. So we find that. So now we have a basis of who he is writing this letter to. And so the first three verses we find is an introduction. Uh, he's a lot like the Apostle Paul in his greeting. He says, for the truth's sake, in verse number two, which dwelleth in us, that being Christ Jesus, and shall be uh, with us forever, because Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. So we have mercy, we have grace, and we have peace. He covers all the bases there, the apostle does. Now, we find in verse number four, the church at Ephesus, uh, it, there he said, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Now, if he's talking about the church there at Ephesus, and we have received a commandment from the Father, that's to keep uh, God first and foremost, and then love one another as we love ourselves, love our neighbors as ourselves. Something between the second epistle of John. And turn with me just for a moment, just one book over into Revel or two books over Revelation. Turn with me there. So remember we're talking about a six year time period. Now he's commending them here, right? He is saying that I have rejoiced greatly in verse 4. That I have found of thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. So we're going to go with the church at Ephesus. Now notice what it says in Revelation Chapter number two, verse number one. John's writing by inspiration. Jesus is here speaking, but John is writing these words of Christ down. This is what Christ says. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. There's the churches. Christ is walking. And he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not found. Let's pause right there. Commendation after commendation after commendation, right? G, uh, John over here in the second epistle is, is, is badging the shoulders of that church up. He's placing those, those, uh, those medals, so to speak. And now Jesus is placing medal after medal after medal after medal. Now remember, we're within a six-year time period here. John is commending them, and Jesus is commending them. That's a good thing when Jesus gives us accommodation, right? But something happened. Verse 4 in Revelation 22, or 2 and 4 says, Nevertheless, I have some, uh, somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. John says, I, great, or I rejoice greatly in verse 4, that I found thy children walking in truth, and as we have received the commandment from the Father. What is that? Love one another. Love Christ, love the Godhead above all else. Then the next commandment that you love one another. So we see how fast that a church, a mega church, now I'm not talking about the mega churches, but I'm talking about a, a God fearing, spirit filled, Christ led church, how fast they can fall when they falter to man's way. Six years is all it took, maybe less. And John goes from rejoicing with them, and Jesus goes from commending them until he says, I have somewhat against thee. You see, Paul set the stage here for the church. And he says this in verse 5. And now I beseech thee. How many of you know that that good King James Bible word beseech? How many of you know what that means? All right. Hallelujah. 
We're going to move some literature learning tonight. Beseech in most contextual parts in your Bible literally means this. I beg of you. Or I ask you with great urgency. So we're not changing the King James, but read it that way. And now I beg thee. John said, I'm begging you, I'm asking you with a godly love to do some things. Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. So we go from walking in truth to walking in love. You see, God in his foundational basis for the church had a way of doing things. Now you want to see a church grow? Here's how we do it. <laughs> Do it God's way. God said walk in truth. Walk in love. Plus nothing. Minus nothing. It didn't say do this and he'll grow you. No, he said walk in truth and walk in love. What's the truth? That's the word of God. I had a conversation with a young man today. Uh, made a profession of faith when he was young. He had a lot of questions about uh, you know Jewish culture and, and, and and luckily it was things I could actually give an answer for. And he said, how do you know that it's true? Well, you know the answer I give. It's because the Bible says it. That's why it's true. It's not, it don't matter that if I like it or if you don't or if you don't even, uh, or if you, you even have a hard time with it. If the Bible says it, it's true. And so that's how we win people to Christ, just give them the truth. And giving them the truth is giving them Jesus. And so they find that he says, walk in love. And now, this. Verse 6 says, and this is love. That we walk after his commandments. What's the Bible say? Be not hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. You are many of them people that know how to do everything. I mean, they can tell you how to build a skyscraper. They can tell you how to build this church. They can tell you how to tear an automobile down and put it back together. But when you put something in their hand, they don't have a clue. Y'all are many of them people. I need to send y'all some of them people. John is saying here, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Walking literally means following after. And if we're following after anything, we should be following after Jesus and not after anything else, not adding to or taking from. And he says that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Being a Pharisee in 2022 is much different than being someone who tries to live holy and righteous according to the word of God. Someone who is holy and righteous, we're all righteous by Christ, by the way. So don't ever let anybody tell you you're not righteous just because if you have Jesus, it's been imputed unto you by him through the Spirit. We find that he says that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. We should strive to be Christians every day. And I said this last week. Trying to live holy is not doing anything else than saying thank you to God. We're not trying to build our name up. We're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're not trying to do anything in ourselves. period. You see, when we start doing things in our, on our behalf, things get haywire real fast. Amen. But if we go about our business today in, in the business of Christ and, and preaching the gospel and we need souls and seeing the church grow, then we're doing what we're supposed to do because we're walking in truth and love. People get real nervous when you start talking about holiness. Y'all ever heard that saying, that holier than thou? Holier than thou? Well, the, the sad fact of that is there are some people that are holier than me. And they're holier than you. Not because of anything they've done, but because they're walking closer to Christ than we are. And we shouldn't begrudge them for that. If you see somebody that God's just pouring out his blessings on, you know the best thing you can do? Be happy for them. Amen. And congratulate them. And say, add a boy or add a, a, a girl. I mean, honestly, be happy for them. 
Uh, but we get this, uh, well, I can't believe that God's blessing them like they do. Well, friend, if, if they're doing what they're supposed to by the word of God and God bless them, who are we to judge? Right? That you should walk in it. It's easy to tell somebody that we're a Christian, but it's a lot different story, John's saying, than showing, showing them we're a Christian. Notice what he says here, verse 7. We find for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh. And this is a deceiver and, and an antichrist. Now notice uh, in your Bible that antichrist is a lowercase a. That's not the antichrist, capital A. That is of an antichrist spirit. They're evil, they're wicked, and I think it is very prominent in the day we're living in that the Antichrist spirit is alive and well. Amen. I mean, it's alive in our school systems. It's alive in our government. It's alive in the homes across the world. It's alive and well. And John says that we should be aware and cautious of those. Remember, we keep going back to that first part of 1 John where he says they came out from us, we're not, but we're not of us. That's who he's talking about here. But it says, look to yourselves, verse 8. Now, y'all ready for this? How many of you ever got smacked on the hand or the bottom when you did something wrong and you lost something from your mom and daddy, your grandparents? Y'all, raise your hand. You know what I mean? You had something coming to you, but then you made a mess of it all and you lost it. You ready? John's not talking about your salvation because you can't lose that. But I'll tell you what John is telling you. He's telling me you can lose your rewards. He's, notice what he says. Look to yourselves. He doesn't say look to your neighbor, not your church family. He says look to yourselves that we lose not the things which we have wrought. But that we receive what? A full reward. Paul said henceforth it's laid up for me a what? Crown of righteousness. Guess what? You have just as good an opportunity as the apostle Paul to have the crown of righteousness placed upon your head at the judgment seat of Christ. But you are and I are just as apt by our walk in this life to have that crown removed from our head. At the judgment seat of Christ. You see there will be many in that day. That will gain a reward. A full reward. There will be many in that day. That will get into heaven. By the good grace and salvation of God Almighty. And through his son. But guess what. They will go in empty handed. Now I don't know about y'all. I don't wear a lot of jewelry. But I kind of like the thoughts of having some bling. When I enter Jesus land. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I don't want to look down the aisle and see my bride got all the all the shiny stuff on and me standing over here in the corner in my robe of white linen. And you say, well, I made it to heaven, but is that really what we're in this for, just to make it to heaven? No. We're in it to please Christ and magnify his name. Now, how do we magnify his name? We walk in truth. We walk in love. We walk in a godly way. Will we falter? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean we can't pick it up and keep walking day in and day. Y'all know, y'all ever had a hero growing up that was an athlete, whether whatever sport it was? They were in that sport for 20 years, 25, 30. Or you had a, a, somebody you admired in the Christian faith and they were the hero of the faith of you. Now let me ask you something. When you first saw them and when you last saw them, the very first time you met them and the very last time, did they not look and act like two different people? You take a, you take, I'm just going to pick on the men here a little while. You take a, a, a star athlete, and, 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 and I'm just going to use Brother Letcher's dad, Brother Billy, went on to be a professional baseball player of the greatest souls. Superb baseball player. I guarantee you, if you sit down and talk to him, I guarantee you his body and his spirit have had some miles put on it at the end of that career. 
right? He didn't feel like that new baller in high school, now did he, when he finished? No. How did you feel like you did when you was 20 years old? God bless you. Quit raising your hand, God. You ain't even made it. <laughs> huh? Why is that? What causes that? Our walk. How many times have you ever said yourself or heard it said, Boy, I wish I'd have took better care? Well, in the physical, that may be true, but you know what? For the Christian, that's where the glory of God lies in our walk. Paul said, I have run the race. I have finished my course. And Christ, upon his entry, said, well done, Paul. And John's saying here that we can have a chance that Jesus Christ himself will look at us and say, well done. Thou, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Ain't that what we want to hear? And so John here is saying look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought. That literally means spiritual loss if you study that out. But that we receive a full reward. You ever been in something that there was a gold, a silver, and a bronze medal? How many of you ever watched the Olympics? They put, the, they put the third one down on a step. They put the second one down on a little higher step. But where's the number one stand? Right in the middle. What's he holding? Or she holding? Gold. Why? They've received the full reward. And by the way, Paul, when he was talking about running race, he was talking about an Olympic athlete, by the way. Number nine says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine, Christ hath not God. What he's saying is there'll be many false prophets, false deceivers, false professions. And he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. I like it when we get the whole package. Aren't you glad when you came to Jesus by faith, you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God? You didn't have to work to get one and not the other. You got them all three in one. That's a wonderful thought. Amen. We find that we, in verse 9, to be fruit bearers. We want to bear good fruit. And the fruit bearers that bear good fruit, he purges. But some that produce bad, the Bible says, that he cut off and cast into the fire. Verse 10, the Bible says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. You know what that literally means? Show them no hospitality. That's hard language, folks. And that is when we must, as Christians, have discernment. Is this some lost person that is lost in the way and needs Jesus Christ, or is this someone that has come? to the knowledge and is there for deception and we must make that discernment and put them away. You didn't know you, there were certain people we didn't have to be nice to. That's what John said. He said them, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak, and have no association with evil. That's what he said. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. How many of you understand verse 11? I'm going to break it down real fast for you here. For he that biddeth him God speed, talking about that evil, that deceiver, that, uh, the, the evil person, God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. That is perfectly correct. You ever been around somebody that tells you what you want to hear no matter the circumstance? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, 
That is exactly what John is saying. Don't be the person that tells the other person what they want to hear. I'm going to tell y'all something. And a lot of people have trouble with this. I don't. Uh, call it like you see it. Don't, the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your head. If you see something that's out of order, nip it in the bud. Don't hee-haw around. Don't tiptoe through the tulips, as them old preachers used to say. Get it over with, get it done, and move on. I can take you to certain people in this walk of life. If I went and had a conversation with them, I can tell you what's going to come out of their lip before they ever start talking. Why? Because they're those people that will tell you exactly what you want to hear. And guess what? When they leave my conversation, they'll go to the next conversation, and they'll talk bad about me, and they'll lift you up. Y'all ain't never had none of them people. I mean, when they come to your house, you're the best thing ever happened. I mean, they, you, you don't do no wrong. They'll pat you on the back, congratulate you, and build you up. And ten minutes later, they'll be down at your neighbor's house talking down about you and lifting them up. John is saying, for he that biddeth in God speed, what he's saying in agreement with him, is a partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things... We're about to draw to a real quick close because John does. Having many things to write unto you. Now notice. Having many things to write unto you. I would not write with paper and ink. But I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. You know what Paul does, or John does right there? He closes, begins to close his letter. Why? Because the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has been lifted. Y'all see that? What does he say? Having many things. He didn't write it. Now did he? He quit. Why? Because the Holy Ghost of God said, that's enough. You see how inspired your Bible is? Now, if John had wrote all those many things down, guess what? It, it would have been fallible, not infallible. And he says this, I would write to you. I would not write what? With paper and ink. What's he quit doing? Quits writing. Why? God's done with this particular letter. <laughs> we should be that way with Christians. When God's done with it, leave it alone. Uh, I, I seen something the other day. Quit Quit going back to things you've already left with God. Right? If you prayed over them and left them next week, quit going back and visit them. I don't know about you, but when I visit somewhere new, I like to see new things. I don't need to go back to the old things. That's why I hate Dollywood. Somebody say amen. Amen. Amen, Mom. Amen. I've seen all that old stuff. I want to see new places and new things. And that's why John quits right here. You can study every commentary that's ever been printed, and on verse number 12, they'll all say this. The Holy Spirit quit convicting John to write, and he lays his pen down, and he says, I'm not writing any more, any more words on paper with ink. Ain't that something? God put a little common sense right in the middle of the second fist with John. Why did he quit writing? Because God was done telling him what he wanted him to write. That's not, not no big great thing. I mean, you know, we should learn, we can learn a lot from that. But he says, and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now listen to what it does. The children of thy elect, sister, greet thee. Amen. What a closing. He was done. Tell everybody, say hello. I'll see you after a while, and I'm going home. That's what he said. Pretty good way to close out a letter, ain't it? And there you have the second epistle of John. Walk in truth. Walk in love. Be not deceived. Have nothing to do with evil. And when God's done talking, listen to him and go on. Boy, that's good church doctrine there. I don't know about y'all, but that, that right there makes a good church constitution if you ask me. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Any comments? All right.